Welcome to Crowder College and welcome to our Servant Leadership Conference. My name is Glenn Coltharp and have the honor of being the president at uh, Crowder College, so it's great to have you here. The, uh, I want to introduce a few people to you. Uh, first of all, Andy Wood over here is our board, board of trustees chairperson. He's our uh, leader that we all look to and he inspires us to, to be a better person just because of, of what he does for the college. If you know Andy, you know what I mean by that. He's just a good guy. The, um, I also have um, a person that I'm going to introduce today, actually twice, because I want to introduce her before the, uh, the afternoon session also, but it's Dr. Jennifer Methven. Dr. Methven was the, uh, the president right before me with it, and we have two things today that she's responsible for that her vision set the stage to help us be here today. First of all, the cohort with it. That was uh, Dr. Methvin's idea to each year select uh, four people that are servant leadership cohort uh, uh, colleagues with it from all across the campus that work on servant leadership projects. And we're now, uh, the one that, was, that uh, provided the leadership for this conference was cohort five with it and we're now also in, we have uh, cohort six that's up and running, so six cohorts with it. But also the second part is today, the, uh, the, the all campus uh, professional development day was Dr. Methvin's idea and her leadership to get this placed in the, in the, uh, in the calendar. He, he, okay, very good. Well, because I was going to say, so if you really didn't want to be here today, blame Dr. Methvin. But since we're a chair, so, uh, the, uh, it, but it was her vision with it for both those areas with it. Let's see, our cohort with it, there they are. We have, uh, uh, the way I remember it, it's Jamie, Jamie, Tosh, and Chet with it. Uh, for some reason, we do, because we, this cohort six has two leases with it, so there must be some rule about that. But at, uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to, come on in. I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. Oh, no, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> need to look at my notes. Uh, Chet, come on up here, because uh, Chet w did all the, the, the cohort during this time has been producing seven videos that if you, haven't had a chance to see them on our web page. Make sure you do. They're on the seven principles of uh, servant leadership, and uh, uh, great videos. Use have a lot of people in the community that are talking about servant leadership, and so. Uh, uh, but Chad also has been taking the lead with preparing today's conference. So I'm going to turn it over to Chad now. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, yeah, we started this process. I was looking at my notes last night. September 27th was the meeting we had a year ago that, that where we were preparing to go to our executive committee and propose that we do the presentation um, today. And so it's, it's been a long process, uh, lots of planning and, and with our cohort. And so the great thing about, <coughs> about Crowder College is when you ask for help, um, People step up and they help. Um, so I was going to um, introduce Dr. Farnsworth, um, but we, we just had a guest um, come in that I wanted to, to introduce. Um, I wasn't sure if, if he was coming this afternoon or this morning. Um, Mr. Tatum, um, James Tatum, one of the, or he is um, a founding board member of Crowder College. Um, is joining us this morning, and thank you guys so much for coming. I so appreciate you coming. <clears throat> so um, I was a student. I was a first-generation college student here at Crowder College. Um, started here in 1996, finished in 1998. Um, Mr. Tatum was on the board. Dr. Farnsworth was the president, and I was just trying to keep my head above the water as a college student, and I don't know that I ever met or interacted with either one of you, but um, this college has been formidable 
um, in, in shaping uh, the trajectory of my life. And so thank you so much for the efforts that you began so many years ago in, in getting Crowder here. Um, I'm going to read the, the bio that, um, that's in the front of your program on Mr. Tatum real quick. Mr. Tatum is often referred to as the father of Crowder College. His life has been defined by service to others. After growing up in Anderson, Missouri, Mr. Tatum attended the United States Military Academy at West Point and was the first McDonald County graduate commissioned as an officer in the United States Army. Captain Tatum led an infantry unit with distinction in the Korean War, wounded in both legs, and he returned home and spent a year in the hospital and was awarded a Purple Heart. Returning to Southwest Missouri, he began serving on, lo on the local school board. Working with area leaders in Newton and McDonald County, Mr. Tatum chaired the effort to create a Missouri Community College. Through their tireless efforts, which included writing and helping pass state legislation to create such entities, Crowder College was established and began providing post-secondary educational opportunities in 1963. For the next 50 years, serving as board chairman, Mr. Tatum not only led Crowder's leadership team, but also established the servant leadership culture that now defines Crowder. The servant leadership culture that Crowder students and the surrounding communities now enjoy blossomed after Mr. Tatum discovered an essay, The Servant as a Leader, by Robert K. Greenleaf. Upon reading Greenleaf's essays, Mr. Tatum corresponded with Mr. Greenleaf. The two visionaries became friends and eventually developed the International Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership, where Mr. Tatum would serve as chairman. These were also formative years for our community colleges, and due to his leadership and expertise and wisdom, Mr. Tatum was hired as an educational consultant and speaker in over 250 different community colleges in 33 states and two Canadian provinces. Mr. Tatum incorporated the servant leadership deep into the ethos of Crowder College, and as the president of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Tatum often challenged the leadership team of Crowder to ensure that no one comes to Crowder without being touched in a positive way, and to ensure that we care for all of the people in our institution, and we are determined to make sure that our caring counts. Through the stewardship of Mr. Tatum, servant leadership now permeates every aspect of, Crowder, of the Crowder experience. In his essays on servant leadership, Robert Greenleaf wrote, if a better society is to be built, one that is more loving, one that provides a greater creative opportunity for its people, then the most open course is to raise the, both the capacity to serve and the very performance as a servant of existing major institutions by new regenerative forces operating within them. Mr. Tatum's life efforts continue to help Crowder faculty, staff, and students and administrators raise their capacity to serve. Participants from institutions of business, education, and community organizations are here today at the conference are the regenerative forces that Mr. Greenleaf described in his essays. Um, I just had a chance to, to meet him in the last year, and um, he hasn't stopped. He was telling me about a, an individual um, on the phone yesterday that um, speaks on the topic of listening. And you've been corresponding um, with this Australian, um, calling him in a different time zone um, to get resources for Crowder on the topic of listening. Um, it's just, it's incredible, and I hope at my age um, I continue to give back um, to the community and society as you've continued to do. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Farnsworth now that I'm sure could tell lots more stories um, about, Mr. Farn or about Mr. Tatum. Um, Dr. Farnsworth is the former president of Crowder College. He has the longest tenure of any institutional leader here at Crowder. Um, he served as president from 1985 to 2004 and then as interim from two or 2013 to 14. Under his leadership, Crowder developed programs fo focused on alternative energy and expanded uh, our international and travel and study opportunities abroad. Uh, Dr. Farnsworth was instrumental in creating our Maddox Hill Behavior Support Center, a facility and program of study that works with children who have autism and developmental disabilities and other learning and behavioral challenges with a goal of helping families access services that they may not have been otherwise able to receive. While enrollment and program offerings at Crowder grew tremendously during his two decade long tenure, his greatest legacy and contribution to Crowder is the stewardship of Crowder servant leadership culture. Working with the founding Crowder board trustee, James Tatum, these leaders nurtured Crowder's service oriented culture. Um, please welcome Dr. Farnsworth as our first speaker.
Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this first conference on servant leadership. Mr. Tatum, wonderful to see you here this morning, and uh, Dr. Methvin, appreciate you being here with, with your group. Uh, in the mid-1960s, early 1960s, <clears throat> a senior executive at AT&T by the name of Robert Greenleaf was becoming increasingly disenchanted with the top-down approach to leadership that he was seeing at AT&T. Uh, he felt as though the authoritarian approach to leadership that AT&T was using at the time was stifling to employee morale, was damaging to customer service, and would not serve the institution well over time. And so he started thinking about what kind of leadership might be more effective, and he was uh, affected by the time also, at the time also, by what he saw as a disenchantment with leadership in the country in general, especially among the younger generation. This was in the early to mid-1960s. And so he became interested in what that generation was reading. And it led him to a book by a German author by the name of Hermann Hesse uh, called The Journey to the East. And in this book, Hesse talks about a group of travelers who are looking for an order where they've been told that the leader of this order, uh, a person of great wisdom, will help them understand the principles that can make their lives and their careers successful. Uh, this is a group of very prominent travelers. And as they travel, they are accompanied by a servant by the name of Leo. And Leo takes care of all of their basic needs as they travel and goes beyond that, helps them plan their direction, helps settle disputes as they arise in the group. But midway through their travels, Leo suddenly disappears and almost immediately the group begins to disintegrate. And they find that the little squabbles that they're having between them are, are not being resolved. They're finding that the day-to-day -day activities that Leo was taking care of aren't being taken care of well. They're finding that they're not being given the direction that they need to know what, what direction they should be going. And eventually the group essentially falls apart. Uh, one of the travelers continues on and eventually finds the order and is introduced to this leader that they've been seeking and finds out that in fact it was Leo. And that Leo had embedded himself in this group to begin with so that as they traveled he would be teaching them the principle that he wanted them to understand. And that was the principle that the thing that would make them successful in their lives was to make it a life of service. Have I accounted that reasonably accurately, Mr. Tatum? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> out, of this, out of the reading of this book, Robert Greenleaf decided that the approach to leadership that he was seeking had to be one that was grounded in service. And it led him to write the essay that Chet mentioned to you, The Servant as Leader, which became the seminal essay of the center that he established. He left AT&T, established the Center for, for Servant Leadership, and began to proselyte this philosophy across the country. I'm going to fast forward a couple of decades to 1983 and the inauguration of Patsy Sampson as a president at Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, Patsy was the first female to be selected as the president of a female college in Columbia, Missouri, Stevens College. And in attendance at, at her inauguration uh, was a former student at, uh, at Stevens College and her husband, Mr. Jim Tatum. And Jim was so, uh, and during her inaugural address, Patsy talked about the influence that servant leadership had had on her personal philosophy and how taken she was with the ideas that had been presented by Greenleaf. And Jim was so taken by that speech that day that he came home and decided that he would hunt down Robert Greenleaf, uh, which he did. Uh, one of the things I've learned about Jim from working with him over the years is that when an idea captivates him, he immediately goes after it and often calls up the person who introduced the idea to him. Uh, and in this case, he called Robert Greenleaf. His travels were taking him to the East Coast, and during one of those trips, he went to see Bob Greenleaf. And they spent five hours together talking about servant leadership. 
And Jim came back to Crowder, having served as the board chair here for 10 years at that time, introduced those ideas to the board and essentially immersed the institution in the philosophies and ideas of servant leadership. About a year and a half later, I appeared on the scene and found a board that was already very committed to this idea and these principles. And together, we began to look forward at a way that we could develop a culture over the next, what has now been 35 to 40 years, that would incorporate those principles and make it a part of this institution. <clears throat> And in the early stages, I think we tried to look at that in both the micro and the macro sense. By micro, I mean look at those things that are really almost unnoticed, but that symbolically represent uh, the essence of what service means. Um, I think probably even those who work here may not be aware of some of the things that um, were initially introduced to try to suggest those principles of servant leadership. One of them you may have noticed when you drove on campus today, is that there is no faculty parking at Crowder College. There is no administrative parking. There is no president's parking spot. The idea is that when you come to this institution, you realize right away that the most important people here are those who are coming to be served. Um, there is no tenure at Crowder College. There is no faculty rank. We don't have assistant professors and associate professors. The idea being that if we are serving the people at the institution as well as we can, if we are being fair and just um, with all of those who work here, we shouldn't need those, those structures. We shouldn't need those things that force us to be fair and just. Uh, and I think that that's worked over time. On a more macro level, uh, the things that became more obvious we made the decision that every student who came here should have every opportunity that he or she would have if they had chosen to attend anywhere else. And that's a big order for a small rural community college. But we set about doing it by trying to think of ways that we could expand opportunities for students that would create an environment for them that was equivalent to any they would find elsewhere. One of the early ways that we did that was to try to very broadly expand international studies opportunities for students. And within the next, over about the next 10 years, Crowder developed what was probably the most robust international studies program among the community colleges in the state, including uh, St. Louis, which had quite a big one. And students from Crowder were able to study in Australia and England and France. The Ag Department as a whole uh, participated in an exchange with Russia. And uh, the whole Ag Department, including the faculty and staff, and well, some of the staff, and any student who was able to go, uh, exchanged with the Technical and Agricultural College in the South Central Ural Mountains. Um, a number of those students had never been on an airplane before. And none of them had been outside of the United States before. And several of the faculty had not. Um, and they came back from that experience different people, having experienced what they could have uh, uh, achieved had they gone to perhaps the best colleges and universities in, in the country. Uh, it was so important to the department that they've done it every year since. And for any ag department people here, how many years has that been now? 25 years. 25 years. Every year the department goes somewhere, uh, either internationally or in the country. Um, our alternative energy and technology program afforded the same kinds of opportunities to the college. And teams from Crowder College consisting of students and faculty and even members of the community raced solar cars across the United States, across the outback of Australia, and through Japan. Had an opportunity to accompany that team on the first Trans-Australia Solar Race. And I remember a night sitting in a little town in the Northern Territories of Australia, a little town called Catherine, uh, around a pool with a team from MIT and a team that was led by Paul Mitchell, uh, the beauty products mogul, who was there with the team that he was sponsoring from Hawaii. And that night, a group of Crowder students and people from Neosho 
and Crowder faculty and staff talked technology with the team from MIT and with the team from, Austra from uh, Hawaii. The Crowder team beat MIT, beat Stanford, be beat Caltech, beat Ford Motor Company, and beat every American entry other than General Motors who won the race. And again, the students came back from that experience recognizing that they could talk to anybody, that they had an experience that prepared them to be ready for anything, and it was equivalent to what they would have received had they been going to school anywhere else. I was especially proud of the faculty and staff that we had at the institution at that time who embraced this idea of servant leadership to the point that they believed that it was their responsibility to identify everybody served by the institution, go out and find them, and ask them how we could help them. We had a young director of our um, business, and tech, business and industry program at the time named Roger Wagner, who with his team, I think, visited every major industry or business in the seven ca county area that we're assigned to serve, sat down with them and asked them, how can we help you in terms of training your employees. And over the next several years, Crowder developed the most robust uh, business and industry training center in, in the state, rivaling St. Louis, in fact, uh, exceeding their, their work uh, many years. Um, Tiffany Slinkert, I saw Tiffany come in, and Pam Hudson did essentially the same thing with all of the high schools in our seven county region, going to them and saying, what can we do to make sure that your students have a more successful experience as high school students. And because of that effort, applied for a series of grants that have made Crowder probably the most significant uh, provider of, uh, of TRIO programs, of Upward Bound, uh, in, among the community colleges in the state, and one of the largest and most successful programs in the Midwest. Um, the idea always being, uh, who do we serve? How can we go to them and find out what their needs are and take care of them in a way that makes them healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, and better able themselves to serve? Of course, as boards changed over time and as administrations changed over time, the emphasis changed to some degree. In fact, uh, Chet mentioned that I was here for an interim year, <coughs> and I'd been away from the institution for seven years. I found that 75% of the people at the college when I came back were new to it. Uh, and so people changed over time, but the one thing that didn't change was this fundamental belief that our responsibility as an institution was one of service. And the principles of Greenleaf and, and servant leadership remained fundamental to that. Under Dr. Uh, uh, Marble's leadership, I think the emphasis became more external. Uh, there was much greater emphasis on growing our centers in Cassville and Nevada and Webb City, creating a new center in McDonald County, placing centers in some of the smaller communities out so that we made sure that we were providing service out in those areas. By the time Dr. Methvin came, that, that growth and change had meant that there was a whole generation of employees who were not familiar with servant leadership, or at least not as deeply uh, immersed in servant leadership as those had been before. And so I think, and I'm speaking for you, Dr. Methvin, <laughs> but a lot of that emphasis turned internal again and became one of how do we re-educate and make sure that our people understand what it means to be a servant leadership. And as a result, these cohorts were established with the four people chosen within the institution that represented a cross-section of those who worked here. And they were given the responsibility every year to prepare a program that would reintroduce, for those who were not familiar with it, servant leadership, and reimmerse those who were uh, to the philosophy. Um, Dr. Colthorpe benefited from that being in place, and I think it's now begin to shift that externally by take, creating conferences such as this that expose our extended community to the ideas of servant leadership. I want to wrap up by talking about just a couple of principles that I found especially uh, helpful and encouraging to me about servant leadership as a leader. The first one was that servant leadership is by its very essence ethical. It's fundamentally ethical. 
we had to ask the leader first to ask the question, what is right in this situation? What will be fair and just and equitable to those being served? In a day like we're in today, where that seems to be absent in leadership all around us, I think it gives us a beacon of hope that there is an approach to leadership that remains just and fair and equitable. Um, I heard complaints every now and then as I talked to people about servant leadership and as others did, uh, that people worried that it would be a soft approach to leadership, that it might excuse behavior or uh, mistakes um, uh, and just sort of pass them off as, oh, we're serving you by being gentle to you. Um, let me give you an example of how that's not true. Um, several years ago, I read in the paper um, that our team, our softball team, as it approached the national championship game, had lost that critical game by a couple of runs. And it surprised me as I read the account in the paper to see that the player on the team who had the, the highest batting average uh, for the year, one of the highest batting averages in the nation, and one, was the, one of the leaders in the nation in terms of home runs had not played in that game. Uh, I learned from the coach later on, this wasn't when I was in the leadership position, I think maybe Dr. Nesman was, um, that all the players when they come to Crowder College sign a commitment letter that they will attend class, they will take advantage of the study hall opportunities that are given to them, and that will be a condition for playing. And as the semester approached a clo its close, this young lady had decided that perhaps with the semester coming to an end and with them doing so well in their softball performance, it wasn't going to be that important for her to go to class. Uh, not so, said the coach. Uh, they had a little heart-to-heart -heart discussion in which he said, you signed a commitment letter here. You made a commitment to yourself. You made a commitment to your team. You made a commitment to this institution and you broke your commitment. But I'm not going to break my commitment to you, which was you're not gonna play if you don't do those things and you're not going to play. Um, a number of years later, now a successful teacher and coach in her own right in the Kansas City area, she came back and told that coach that it was the most important lesson she had learned while she was at Crowder. The other thing that I really appreciated about the whole idea of servant leadership is that it is by its very nature systemic. It's a systems approach to leadership. It asks of every leader who is going to be touched by this decision in the broadest sense. Who's going to be touched by it in any way? And how will the decision that we make influence our service to that person? Um, it forces every decision beyond the two parties that are immediately involved out into the community, out into the schools we serve, and out into those who are otherwise served by the institution. Now in terms of pitfalls, and I think every, every approach to leadership and management has its own pitfalls. And I think the one that I uh, felt as though became problematic in certain cases, not here so much as, as in other places, is that it's very easy to let our sense of service get out of balance. To let the voices that are the loudest and the closest and the most strident and perhaps the ones that have the greatest influence on our careers and futures uh, begin to drive what we think our sense of service needs to be. We see that in business when shareholders and profit becomes more important in terms of service than do customers and the general public. We see it in education when the voices of faculty or some other group become loud enough that we begin to think that they are who we serve rather than student and community and others. I worked at a university for six years <clears throat> after leaving here and found, much to my chagrin, that in many cases the undergraduate students were viewed as, an, as a necessary inconvenience and that the community was viewed as being there to serve the institution rather than vice versa. And when that begins to happen, servant leadership gets out of balance. Uh, in service and, and not-for-profit organizations, I think sometimes 
we forget that we're not only serving the clients who are immediately served by the organization, but we're serving the community in which those clients move and live. And there has to be a balance struck between those all the time in terms of how we're serving them. But fortunately, Robert Greenleaf gave us an answer as to how we manage that balance by saying to us, first of all, you must consider who is being touched by this organization in the broadest sense. And as we serve them, are we helping them become healthier, freer, more autonomous, better able themselves to serve? And if we can answer those questions with a yes, then we're doing the job we're supposed to be doing. Thank you all for being here today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been a pleasure to have a chance to visit. <laughs>